mechanical integrity inspection protocols for ammonia refrigeration systems. This is about stopping ammonia being released from ammonia refrigeration systems that can endanger people. The UK regulation standards appropriate um, to ammonia refrigeration systems. There are a lot of them, but for the, the regulations, the Press System Safety Regulation 2000 and the Provision of Work Equipment Regulations 1999, they are the most applicable regulations, while the most applicable standards is EN 378 and EN uh, 12693. They're, in general, they're about the safety of the environment, but it's while there is a lot of other standards, you need to focus more on these two standards because you could otherwise be looking at another 20 other standards. Common issues with new ammonia systems, particularly those who actually have been certified to the PED by notified bodies, while you might expect these systems to be uh, well designed, it is often found that they are poorly designed because the notified bodies don't always have the experience with ammonia refrigeration systems. And the common issues found are pressure relief valve settings connected to the same part of the systems, which are incorrectly. An example, a noise separator may have a pressure relief valve setting of 20 bar. However, on a condenser, it may have a setting of 16 bar. So if there's a problem with the compressor, the wrong relief valve goes and the relief valve may be too small, so you have a premature release. Compressor overflow valves may set higher then an oil separator internal relief valves. Again, is an oil separator may be set at 20 bar, the overflow valve set at 25 bar, and the capacity overflow valve is, could be 10 times that of the fire rated relief valve, but the, the relief valve on the, on the oil separator goes before the overflow valve, meaning a premature release again. Compressor high pressure cutout switches correct in setting, a higher rating than they should be, and therefore relief valves below instead of plant stopping. Other areas like oil recovery vessels, the width not to correct valves, a regulating valves that they can't for valve, which means the system actually hasn't been designed safely. And then there is no system in place to stop fluid pumps. In, in principle, um, if the compressors aren't available, the glyco pumps keep running, heat up the system, or the pressure of the system or relief valves go prematurely, instead of the system just stop the, the, uh, the fluid pumps. And again, it is a low pressure set point to stop plates freezing. And if and all it needs is a set point to say compressor stop, if, go, if the suction pressure goes below, say, in a water system below minus two, and stop plates from freezing, in essence, you don't burst the plates. And finally, hot gas defrost systems. This is a very prevalent one in which liquid hammer occurs due to liquid condensing in liquid lines. There must be a system in place that this liquid is drained uh, at, uh, so the liquid doesn't build up and cause liquid hammer. So what, are the, what is the pressure system safety regulations? Well, the requirement is to carry the written scheme examination by a competent person. And by a competent person is somebody who knows what they're doing. So what is the contents? Well, you must give the safe operation limits must be established. You must know what the protective devices are. You must actually indicate whatever uh, pressure vessel or pipeline where it might affect my cause from stored energy. So really, it's pressure test safety regulation is about stored energy. It isn't just about little leaks. So the focus on the regulation uh, is stopping an explosion or a blast happening from an ammonia system. Then it must also specify the period between the examinations. Is it, is it one year, is it six months, depending on the system and the safety specify how you will actually carry out the examination and, and the type of examination and the period of the examination. So a competent person, according to the regulations, must inspect the system and declare the system is, is safe to a specific date. An example, in one year's time, you may say the system would be safe to the 1st of January 2017 and the following year will be 2018, but it needs to be a specific date where you're kind of putting your neck on the line to see if the system is safe to operate. But the whole system needs to be looked upon as if you're actually carrying out a hazard. So you must look at the potential risks. So while there's a written scheme, the person preparing it must 
Karen has up without actually preparing the paperwork. The provision use of work equipment regulations, I kind of consider the forgotten regulations. You mention to people, they don't actually know about it. People carry out written scheme examination of PSSR, they don't actually know this regulation exists and the requirement. But what it actually states is, every employer must reduce the likelihood of an intended release of gas and liquid that can cause a hazard. A hazard is a toxic release, but also may call an intended explosion. So if you get a, a release in a place where you're not planned for it, you can actually get a, a toxic, can affect people, and, and an explosion potentially. So the regulation also requires that any equipment that is prone to deterioration, that can cause a danger, must be remedied before it occurs. Therefore, you must carry it in inspection, and you must document what you're doing. So it's not, you can't just look around and say, oh, yeah, it should be okay. You must actually have a plan in place on how you're actually going to maintain it. And a person who plans that needs to be a competent person. Now, one of the strange ones is, everybody is aware of the classification of areas, Explosive Gas Atmosphere 679-10-1, for classification of areas. It's considered well the pipe is not a source of release. So if you have a pipe going through a roof void or in a plant room, you will consider that not to be a source of release. But however, what happens if corrosion happens? It now becomes a source of release, and therefore it is very important these inspections are carried out. So what are the inspection requirements? There is really two types of inspection requirements. Preventing ammonia systems from overpressurizing and pressure envelope aging. So where do we get our information about uh, system of pressurizing. EN 378 uh, part 2 gives in detail the requirements and it gives details about compressor high pressure cutouts to be tested annually, uh, low pressure switches on uh, freezer fluids to be tested annually, names on relief valves to be checked and the appropriate settings and to be replaced or recalibrated every five years and all from the in place to be changed annually in case someone has done something in the last 12 months. So it is very, very detailed and there is kind of no getting away with it, it is black and white out there. However, when it comes to pressure envelope ageing, there is lots of information out there. However, in the UK, the Health and Safety Executive has published documents, the Management Ageing of Plant and Best Practice for uh, Risk-Based Inspections as part of Integrity Management System. So these two documents give the basis of what you should be doing. So what is ageing? The term ageing is not about how old a plant is, it's about its condition. An example is you can have a plant that is 30 years old and might look to be 2 years old. However, you have a 2 year old plant and it could look as if it's falling to pieces. So really, it's not about the ageing, it isn't about the age of the plant, it's actually about its condition and how it is deteriorating with time. So what are the mechanisms of ageing? External corrosion and erosion? Well. There's two areas with that, there's wet aqueous corrosion, which is water going onto like pipe and a chemical reaction occurring and a corrosion occurring. But we mostly in refrigeration systems have painted pipe. We actually more suffer from general corrosion, which is pitting and surface corrosion. Now really, what is pitting? Well, pitting is like little holes occurring in piping, while surface is like little slits occurring. So they're very, very similar and they both occur at this, near the same time. The other types of corrosion out there, internal corrosion and erosion, but these, this isn't seen in ammonia plants and there's no point in checking for it. Stress corrosion cracking, while stress corrosion cracking can occur in new ammonia systems, it isn't something you need to check for because if it happens by the time you do your second inspection it's too late. So there's no point in checking for stress corrosion stress cracking. Cyclic stresses, especially for systems with reverse cycle defrost which warm and cool, it's very prone to it. However, it needs to be checked out, but the risks are actually quite low. However, if you have stainless steel pipe, expansion contraction can be more prevalent. Mechanical damage from the likes of fork trucks um, or other mechanical equipment hitting piping, that is a risk and there should be appropriate measures put in place so, it, so this does not happen. Failure pipe supports and anchors, i.e. vessels and piping, well if this does occur, as part of the inspection, you should see it before it happens because if you're looking at a vessel, you should just look at the supports all around it. 
flange leakage and bolt failures. Well, if a flange leaks and a bolt, well, you should actually already have seen it before it happens as part of the inspection. And finally, glances and valves. Well, if, it, if they start leaking, they should be replaced or replaced after a certain period of time. So the, the one awkward area is corrosion under insulation because it is all hidden away. So corrosion under insulation is corrosion that is hidden away and, is ex and it is actually the worst type of corrosion you can have because um, literally the insulation causes crevices on the surface of the metal and retains water so it's always wet. Compared with normal pipe, pipe dries and it isn't and, and also when you have rain, the concentration of the chemicals is diluted, while insulation just builds up concentration more and more at time. Uh, the insulation may, may wick, therefore water carries into it, and a combination with water and oxygen is, is perfect corrosion conditions. Uh, contaminants, i.e. particularly on stainless steel pipe with the chlorines from insulation. But the big thing is the insulation hides what is actually happening underneath and that needs to be really focused how you deal with it. Risk-based inspections for corrosion and distillation. So why risk-based inspections? Well, if you don't carry out a risk-based inspection, it would mean all the pipe and vessel insulation would be needing to be removed to examine the pipe underneath. So instead of that, you identify where the risks are and focus on, on the potential danger points. So what how do you determine these risks? It's the temperature, if parts of the system oscillate between chill and freeze, condensation occurs in piping, condensate water and oxygen causes corrosion. Um, um, other, other parts of the system, if well freeze and thaw, you get the same condensation issue. The state of the vapour barrier, if the vapour barrier is in a poor state, the likelihood of uh, water gain to insulation is high, you have wicking and therefore water in contact with the piping and it's prone to risk. Again, it's icing on the outside of the pipe also means the insulation is after breaking down and water is after getting in and if there's condensation, there, they are the signs but they, it doesn't tell you the full fa facts, it is only identifies the potential risk but you need to take all those factors into account together. And one thing is, people may think if you see a bit of frozen pipe that's going to be really detrimental to, um, to corrosion. However, if you have a frozen pipe, you don't have water, you have ice. Ice and oxygen doesn't cause corrosion. On one particular site in the UK where we had actually very bad icing, um, we examined the piping on the site. As you can see from the picture, it's, it looks quite bad and you would think, well, the piping will probably be in a real mess and need a complete replacement. However, if you look at the pictures here, when we took samples, there was actually no corrosion in the pipe, or, or very little. However, there is danger points. Where you have valves sticking up, like this, you may actually find around here you have melt ice, and that is very prone to corrosion. So even though some parts of the system may be frozen, you have points which could be detrimental, and each of these need to be looked at individually. So, what should a report structure be for mechanical integrity inspection? Well, you need something like a, a title page, action list. It's very important to put the action list very much in front of a document because most people, when they look at a document, don't read beyond the first few pages. If you have a document that's 20 or 30 pages, you need to get the primary information that the client needs to look at in the first two or three pages. One part of it is a written scheme of examination describing a system, the vessels and the equipment. So in other words, the written scheme part of it, in other words, what the equipment is and what the inspection regime. And the second part is uh, the inspection that should be done according to it. And that again is, is the protective device, the vessels and the piping. And then at the, at, towards the end of the document, the references and who is signed it off. Um, what are the competencies? Well, qualification experience, understanding and regulation. But the reality is, with all the days, it's actually having a good, solid refrigeration background, understanding the regulations, uh, understanding I, I, things like liquid hammer, understanding how it actually works. If you're coming from a background, non-refrigeration background, do not understand 
the risks of out there, you're going to be already at a weak point. So if you're, if you're a day-to-day -day person um, looking at a boiler, you will assume there's internal pipe corrosion. But the reality is, most systems don't. So you look at the wrong thing and want the wrong type of inspections. You'll waste m money and you'll actually, your risk-based inspection mechanism is all wrong. So understanding, having sound refrigeration knowledge is the most important. But the thing that most people don't, haven't really been looking at very much is, nowadays there's a lot of chill systems. 15, 20 years ago, there was very few chill systems. Because these are higher in temperature, these are very prone to corrosion and therefore need to be inspected. You can't get away, an example, a cold store, 20 years, or a cold store, the, the, the risks are low compared with the chill system. So what's the conclusion? Systems are not always safe to operate, and particularly even if they have a pressure equipment directive certificate C marked. EN378 tells you how to stop a system from pressurizing and also tells you the inspection regime. The forgotten regulation, PURA, tells you that you must actually inspect piping for corrosion and, use, and the HSE tell you you should carry out a risk based inspection. Um, you need to carry the mechanical inspection report. It's no point in just looking on site and just saying, yeah, it looks okay. You must actually document what is out there and what you're doing. Uh, and the report must be fit for purpose. So it isn't a one pager saying it is all okay. It needs to be a proper document. However, the same inspections that we carry out here in the UK can be, it should be the same all over the world. But it is a UK regulation, it's just good practice. 